Hi everybody, I seem to have a pretty good signal where I am now and I'm just waiting now for you all to get your notifications to say that you're live with me. This is the Apprentices House uh, owned by the National Trust, part of Style Quarry Bank Mill. So I'm going to be going in there in a moment but this is a this is a guided tour that I am on because you can't just come in here by yourself um, so if there are other people on the tour kind of which I'm hoping that there might not be but if there are other people on the tour I obviously can't really say very much if I'm stood with them so I really want to show you around in here though so I'm going to take you in round about now so once again thank you for sharing donna kelly you know what i'm going to ask don't you if you can click the bottom left hand side of your device because notifications uh, aren't getting out um now i'm not sure how i get in to this place and there's lots of mud all over the floor so it's not good. I think I might have to go down here. So hey, you're coming with me anyway. So let's let's just see how we get into this place. Okay, there are other people going to be on this tour. So the important thing is you're coming inside with me. So let me know if you see anything, sense anything. Screenshot, screenshot, screenshot. <laughs> Please share, 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 share. Lots of people won't know that we're here doing this because they won't have had a notification. And I get so many messages from people saying, I wish I'd known you were live, I would have watched. And so sad when people don't know. I've got stuck on a gate. Hold on. Right, okay. To look odd filming this, aren't I? No. So, we're just waiting here. There's the house. And we have to wait here for the tour to begin. It starts at half past. Now is just looking for my tickets. There we are. Pizza. Pretty garden, isn't it? Yeah. Donna Cook talking as well will make you look like a loon. <laughs> You're not walking round with me. Pizza's is not walking round with me. That's charming, isn't it? That's Peter. <laughs> Amy Lou says, Debbie, I have pictures of a little boy. Linda Downey, what's the history of this house? Okay. Well, apparently the attic, the attic is very, very active in this house. Uh, there it is, the house. There are people standing there, so I can't really focus the camera <laughs> at them at the moment. Um, the children who were brought to, them work, to work in the mill were housed here. Uh, it was called, it's still called as well, the Apprentices House. So children were housed here to, to them work in the mill. That's the, that's the history that I know about, but we're going to find out so much more when we go inside, okay? So I'll be filming, but trying not to film the people that are on the tour. So, if I do have to stop the filming for any reason, just wait for me to come back on. So, Paula Adams, hi Debs, go say. Pretty landscape, Eileen Carg. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Look. Are you going inside, Dylan Graham? Yes. 
two dukes. There's definitely a little blonde boy I saw earlier, about five-ish. Um, Chelister, I got a free ticket watching you. <laughs> Donna Westenberg says, get some veg on your way out. <laughs> be in bed for night shift said Linda Downey boy you're going to be tired tonight Linda go to bed and catch up with it later it's a lovely place it's beautiful isn't it hi Deb I got photos that's Nicola May Atkinson oh and Pam Preston says she's posted a few photos we're just waiting now any second we should be going into this building would you in at half past four Love these, so exciting, Joanna. Redgrave, Robert Adams, would love to be there with you. I've heard about this place, good luck, Debbie. Yeah, Sam, Machen Turner, mm. National Trust's third most haunted place. Oh, I think that bell means that we're going in, okay? So, there we go. So, I won't be talking. I'll be being quiet. If anybody asks why, can some of you please comment and tell them why? Thank you. Right, go. Thank you. Thank you. So, it doesn't sound like a lot, but back then, it was. 
Mr. Greg was under no obligation to give his apprentice workers any education, so he was quite ahead of his time. Both boys and girls were taught how to read and write, but only boys were taught maths, as obviously girls' brains are too small to do with numbers, they'll get headaches, they'll start crying, they'll play on the floor, just can't cope with it. Some of you are nodding, you should be going no. <laughs> was his punishment for the apprentices. So it was commonplace to beat the children with canes and with whips, bring the horrible ones such as a piece of rope tied on the middle, and then be dangled from the ceiling of other machines that were switched on, yeah. which if you've been down to the mill, you can imagine how terrifying that would have been. Um, the worst one, I think, is having your ears hammered to a bench. <sighs> oh, that's awful. Frankly, none of that happened here. Official company line was no physical beating or punishment like that. Instead, in the house, we had the dumbbells. So you did something wrong, you had to stand the arms outstretched for up to one hour, depending on what you've done. So it is quite a physical punishment, because it does make your arms hurt only after about two minutes, but it also strengthens the muscles. So you get stronger, you can carry more cotton when you go to work the next day, you'll be making Mr. Greg more money, you become a better worker, worker by doing the punishment. As obviously, if you get a child, they're injured, so they won't be able to physically work as hard next day, so they lose the money. And the other punishment was a fine system. So fines, you obviously have to pay money, but you don't earn money in your 12 hours a day. The only way you can earn it is by doing overtime at one penny an hour. So if you broke a window, you had to pay two shillings, that is 24 pennies. That means 24 hours of extra work spread over a few months. Stealing an apple from the orchard was even worse. That was a five shilling fine. 60 pennies, 60 hours of burning time. So yeah, really hefty fines, but again, a very clever punishment. The only way they can do it is by doing more work for Mr. Beck. So, any questions so far? No? Everyone all right going up and downstairs? Excellent. So we'll head upstairs here, pull the door for the person behind you, and as I said, we'll take the time up. Thank you. 
toilet facilities available underneath the beds. Chamber pots, also known as gazundas, so called because they. Gazundas are there. Thank you. Gazundas. And you didn't have a chamber pot each or per bed. You shared a chamber pot between 10 people. Oh, no. That, that's not <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So there is no privacy in the hall. It's not very nice at all. And then the chamber pots get full. You've emptied them into a bucket. And then, boys, it would have been your job to collect oh, the buckets in the morning. That would be nice. Yeah. And you'd empty them onto the lovely vegetable garden where they'd be used as fertilizer. So everything we used in the house including the straw. So after you slept in your bed for a year, the straw would be put in piles around the room and then it would be the apprentice's toilet paper. So everything oh, kept. That would be nice. It would not be nice, <laughs> no, very itchy. Feet crawl is everywhere, yeah. But everything dumped to keep it as cheap as possible. Uh, the walls were painted white once a year, as required by law. There would have been no lighting up here at all, so really dark, because lighting, candles, more money that the children didn't deserve. There's no curtains on the windows. Again, don't need to be comfortable to go to sleep. Not even pillows on the beds. And there is no form of heating up here at all. So again, more money. But also candles and a fire, huge fire risk. And we've got wooden floors in the bed, straw mattresses, and the children were locked in here at night. So there's no escape. It's something you weren't to go wrong. And you can see there's not many personal possessions in our room. We've got some cute and cloaks over there. So cloaks for them to wear when they're going out and about, because believe it or not, sometimes it rains in Manchester. And the hoops, they were toys they could play with on Sunday afternoon to have the afternoon off. But no other forms of entertainment up here, and there's no wardrobe, because the children had two sets of clothes with their name. They wore one for a week to go to work in and to sleep in. They put the second clean set on on a Sunday, wear that one for a week, and the first set will be being washed in that week. And these will just be recycled again and again. And they got a new set of clothes every two years, which is why it was so important that the girls repaired the children's clothes every evening. Any questions? It's very eco-friendly, isn't it? Very eco-friendly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Taking it back to basics. Mm. This is the of sound of the beds. So. Yeah. Um, they're five foot long. They're not the original beds. But when we took over the house in the 1970s, the original flooring of this room was still in, and there was scuff marks on the floors and the walls where they'd been pushed up. So this is how we base them. But the average height of a grown woman in the 1800s was four foot ten, and a grown man five foot one. So they should have fitted in until they were 18, but not as few for the boys. But these averages were for the poorer people. They don't get enough food to break properly, and they do manual jobs where they can shoot. Excellent. So we'll head down the stairs here. I'll go. Down first to open the door. It's not your head from the top. Do you know what I am? Yes, I can. This is. Oh, I feel as if it was filled with disease. I feel scarlet fever. I feel. I feel terribly grim up here. To be honest with you, I couldn't speak all the way through that. I'm sure people are looking at me, wondering what I'm doing. Very grim, Pete. Very grim. There it is, folks. Compared to a nine year old, are quite remarkable. So it did help the kids. 
Uh, so once you've given the old you were, you would have a quick medical examination, and then you were on probation for a month. So if on that month you started causing trouble, or you've got health issues, you were just sent back to 18 months. You pass that month, you sign your contract, you start work, and that is where the real fun begins. Lots of problems down at the mill, number one being headaches. You work in very loud machines, you get dehydrated as well, you don't get breaks. So to treat a headache, the doctor would use a poultice. So it's a small cloth bag filled with different herbs and plants, depending on where on the body it hurts. So for a headache, it's oats and roasted seeds. Heat it in a pan until piping hot, and then place on the affected area. So you would soon forget about your headache, as you'd have a third degree burn on your forehead. <laughs> Makes a blister, the doctor would cut it open, and the liquid that came out of the blister would be the badness that's making your head hurt. So you get rid of the bad liquid, you get rid of the headache. Yeah. And I think you never own up to having a headache ever again after you've had it done once. Uh, treatment number two is goose fat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and this is used to treat coughs by breathing in all the cotton dust. So this would be rubbed straight onto your chest. And if you had a really bad cough, this would be rubbed into a jumper. And you'd wear the jumper for six months or so. Yeah. By which point the cough would probably have gone nothing to do with this, and you'd have just been really stinky for those six months. <laughs> Number three is if you felt a bit sick, you'd be given teaspoonfuls of medicine. This is treacle and brimstone. So treacle isn't too bad, you can have influence. Brimstone is a very special ingredient used in gunpowder and fireworks and explosives to make them go boom. So you would have some of this and you would explode all of the badness from one end or the other. <laughs> yeah, you go. So not particularly pleasant and you just have to chain the pots and straw to deal with it and then it all gets put onto the vegetables. So big cycle of bacteria and the illness there. Last one. Again, you used to treat problems caused by the cotton dust. This time, the dust that went into your eyes. So they get very itchy, very irritated. They'd swell up. So the doctor thought your eyes were swollen because there was too much blood going on your eyes. So, to get rid of too much blood, the doctor would use loads of stuff on creatures. Oh, not leeches. Yeah, leeches. Very good. So, they are real, so don't stick your hands in. If you don't want to look, close your eyes and I will pass you by. Last weekend, someone fainted. So don't do that, please. I've met you this and I feel like I'm about to die. Yeah. Oh, please. And they can grow up to ten times their size when they're full. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> just so you know, I'm not just sat here. Just really I did, I did ask oh. first. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so leeches have three mouths. Each one has a set of 100 teeth, so 300 all together. So when they bite, they really do that thing. And they feed until they're full, at which point they drop off. Or you can force them off with heat or salt. Yeah, so. so the swollen eyes, the doctor would put a leech underneath the eye a leech at the side of the eye, and then a leech on the actual eyelid as well, held there by a cotton blindfold. So yeah, although it didn't hurt, I imagine it would not be very pleasant at all to go through. So, any questions? <laughs> Where did you do his training? <laughs> <laughs> he is a very young Indian doctor, actually. Right. His nephew, I think, treated Queen Victoria, yeah. and his niece was Elizabeth Gaskell, daughter. Mm. Yeah. But then, I wouldn't have wanted to be treated by it. So, how many children do you think you think died every year? So, how many children were there here? Nine, nine total. total. Nine total. And how many died each year? About like ten. Less. Seven. Less. One. Less. One. Less than one. One child every two years, on average. Mm -hmm. Which is incredibly low. Mm -hmm. So, Mills and Inner City Manchester, easily 10, 20, 30 children would have died every single year. So, this is because we have the doctor here, 
He does sometimes help. Some of the treatments do work, the ones related to hers and things that are coming back into fashion. And if you lived in a workhouse, if you lived in a mill in Manchester, you would never have seen a doctor before. Yeah? When you're talking about like people have bad value, are you talking about machinery or this or both? Both. Okay. Yeah. So I think only one child, one apprentice died from a machine accident. Yeah, somebody else said one of the chaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a very nice way to go. His, his head got caught and then. Oh, that's yes. nice. Yeah, not very nice. Oh, gosh. Mm. Um, but lots of children would have lost a finger or two that was to be expected in the machines. And they would have all gone deaf because they were so loud. Mm. Yeah, so the doctor here means not that many deaths. And more importantly, we're away from the city. We've got clean air, clean water as well. And they're quite isolated, so contagious diseases aren't going to be passed on by someone just strolling through the village. You don't just pop in, you know, and live somewhere else. But yes. So no one has a headache or a sore eye, they want to take care of. No. Cool. Well, I'll head down the stairs in a minute then. You'll be able to look into the parlour on your right. This was the superintendent's room. So these were the husband and wife team who looked after the children. Paid around £10 a year in the 1790s, which was on a par with a butcher or small business owner like that. So it's the nicest room in the house. There would have been a bed in there as well. So have a glimpse at how the other half lived as we walk to the kitchen. Um, sorry, can I just ask, you said yeah. um, they signed the contract. Was that just a formality or was the choice? Um, it was a legal document, um, which meant they signed their life over, basically. Mm. So they wouldn't have been able to read it. It would be read out to them. And by signing it, they would have made an X to say they agreed to do it. So it was a legally binding document, uh -huh. so one of the conditions was you weren't allowed to run away. So if you tried to run away, you'd be breaking your contract, you could be sent to jail, or you would have to pay you know, a huge fine once you were found and brought back here. And it just meant you agreed to work for the 12 hours in return for board. Right. Yeah. And that was for life? Well, until they were 18 years old when they finished their apprenticeship. Where's the boys? Like, you know, that like upstairs. Yeah, so it would have been three rooms of around the size. So there's above us, um, rooms like that, but it's got rotten corners and you can't take you up there. But there would have only been ten boys in a room of this size. So they have quite a bit more space than the girls compared to the camp conditions in there. But again, that's the boys are spread out because they thought if you cram them in, they'd all start fighting. How many of the apprentices went on to just live and work in the village? And I don't know the number, but quite a few. Yeah. So lots of them married each other, went over to the village, and then their children would go and work in the mill, not as apprentices, but as free children. Mm -hmm. But they were free to do what they wanted when they did hit 18. So some of the boys went to join the army, some of the girls became maids, some went to work land, some went back to where they came from. But if you could stay on here, you, you'd want to. And if this has been your home for the past 10 years or so, you don't know anywhere else, this is a lot better than working in this inner city of Manchester. So that if there was a job here, you would try to get it. Mm -hmm. Good. So, up downstairs. Top of the Yeah, it is though, isn't it? Yeah. So, here we go, guys. I can really hope you're enjoying this. <laughs> That's where I was just sat then. So I'm just showing you around this room before we leave it. I think there was quite a bit of activity around here, especially there on those stairs. So that's where we were before where the girls all slept. This is the medicine room. Fireplace there to put on. 
And then these two white bits in the corners might buy them deep and then put on top in large pots. As a cooking for 90 children at the same time, it is quite a big job. So helping out the superintendents, there's also a maid and a cook who lived up in the attic. The apprentices woke up at half past five to start work at six. Breakfast was at eight o'clock and was eaten down the mill as to not waste time walking up and coming back down. Now there are no plates or bowls at the mill, so they had to have their breakfast in their hand. So they'd all queue up, hold out the hand, and they'd be given a nice big dollop of porridge. Cooks so thick, so you can have it in your hand, and it's not going to make a mess. So more like a flapjack, you can just cut it out. So I know it looks really tasty, but it's cold, it's made with water, not with milk, and there's no sugar or fruit or syrup in there. But the good news for the apprentices was that they could have had as much porridge as they wanted. <laughs> Lucky them. So not like Old Beatrice here, they could go back for seconds and thirds if they wanted to. And then lunch was also eaten down at the mill, but everyone likes to have a wild guess at what they have for lunch. Porridge. Porridge mixed with vegetables, so perhaps beans, perhaps sprouts, uh, cabbage, broccoli, onions, carrots, whatever you wanted, chopped up and mixed in with the porridge. Again cold, but again as much as they wanted, until tea time, which was eaten back up here. Always hot food in the evenings, so combinations of potatoes and vegetables on their own in soups and stews with bread and with meat three times a week, which was a lot for the 1800s, and again, as much as you wanted at tea. So just to compare this to the workhouse, you had two meals a day, say potatoes and bread for one of them, and then gruel in the evening. So gruel is water, I know it's like we've got here, but it's incredibly watery. You don't get any fresh vegetables there, you hardly ever get meat, and as all of the twists found out, you can't go back for more after you've finished. So, I know it's not a very nice house by today's standards, but back then, 19th century, this was five star accommodation. You had an education, you were not eaten, you had a bed, you had a doctor, and you had three meals a day as much as you wanted. So Mr. Greg was quite ahead of his time in looking after his apprentices. He was very kind, very Christian, very liberal and enlightened, but also very clever. As if you could give a child an education, they can do more skilled work for you later on. If you don't beat them, not injured, more work. If you give them a bed, more sleep, more energy, more work. Give them a doctor, they're less sick, they don't die, so more work. And three meals a day means they get healthier, they get stronger, means they can do more work for you. So on one hand, he's a nice man, on the other hand, he's a good man, and they have a nice man, and they have a nice man. So, on that note, then this. Outside, we have the long bus. The outside tree, when the children mm -hmm. Pulling me through there for some reason. <laughs> I keep seeing orbs above my head. Yeah. Here. It's apparently haunted. Apparently so. Talking about hauntedness. Oh. <laughs> There's been stories of someone yeah. in the girls' bedroom. Yeah. Uh, some our colleague came past, thought she saw another colleague waving from the window. Yeah. In costume. Yet when she got in the house, the the colleague Don't wasn't dressed that. up yet. Yeah. Really. So I was just like, mm, that's nice. You're live on my Facebook page. Oh, hello. Um, with, <laughs> hello. with quite a few thousand people watching. 
at this moment in time, by the way, but there, they've just, I, I asked permission, first of all, before filming, so I can finally talk now, everybody. <laughs> So they said it was okay to film because I wanted to check. Um, I just didn't try to stay away from recording anybody else that was in the group. But um, part of one of the, the reasons for being here is about the fact that it's apparently the third most haunted property at the National Trust Stone. So oh, according nice. to the press, nice. yeah, all the, the Daily Mail and all the other different press reports. And apparently there's lots of noises that come from the attic. It's where they believe the punishment room was. Yes. Oh, really? I mean, we've heard stories. I mean, now and again, you think you hear something, but more often than not, it's just a creaky door. Yeah. Um, but, no, I mean, personally, I, I've been here a year. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. You know, it's, you, you, you're always going to get people going, oh, well, you know, I've heard this story, yeah. I've heard that story, blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, yeah. you do hear things, but it's... It's an old house, but... Yeah, it does old houses do out. creak, don't <laughs> yeah, they? Yes, they do. It's whether or not anything's ever been seen, I suppose, that's really, yeah. you know... So. Not by me, unfortunately. No. Yeah. We've just, <laughs> just heard the stories. You've just heard the stories. Oh, yeah, wow. Very creepy place, isn't it, though? Well, <laughs> I suppose, I mean, it's, it's not so bad. It's a nice sunny day today. But, yeah. Um, when it's winter and, and, you've, and dark. And you've got on yeah. the with nobody yeah. else here, it can be a bit creepy, intimidating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Three o'clock in the morning, it probably wouldn't feel so great, yeah. would it? <laughs> <laughs> I say I wait till everybody else comes before I go in the house. I switch all the lights on and then wait. <laughs> Do I you? Like it. Honestly. <laughs> to be fair, I don't like going in the parlour. No, don't you? No. Which one's the parlour? The the little room, the superintendent's room at the bottom of the treatment room stairs. Yeah, that room there. It's, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not fast on that. Yeah, it's a bit creepy that room, isn't it? Yeah. I just stuck the camera around in there before, so you know everybody could see. And um, yeah, it's a bit it's a bit creepy, isn't it? Yeah. To be fair. I think it's just my Welsh sensibilities. <laughs> I saw before some comments going on um, on here. They're all saying, tell them who you are, Deb. <laughs> um, oh, gosh. Deborah Davis, Psychic Medium. So if you look on Facebook, you'll see Deborah Davis, Psychic Medium. So we've got over 300,000 people on the page. Oh, wow. And um, I, I wanted to kind of take them all with me today to come and look in here because... It's obviously got quite a reputation. So um, they have been commenting saying, somebody said before about seeing a white mist go past in front of the camera. So I don't know quite where that was seen yet since I, since it was since she left the schoolroom. Um, so yeah, I don't know quite yet. <laughs> I'm not going back in. <laughs> Yeah, and I did feel as if I was being pulled to that bottom room there and the stairs. Definitely those stairs leading down from that medicine room. Definitely, most definitely being pulled towards those stairs. Very creepy. Definitely. But I've got lots of footage in here, so we'll have to go back and see. If you do manage to get on the page later on Facebook, people will have screenshot anything that they've seen. So I know I could see them yeah. talking about orbs before... So. Uh, to be fair, I um, last year brought my children here on a tour and I took a couple of photos and I noticed some orbs. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah. But I think it's just my kids. I, they, just, <laughs> they just attract them. <laughs> yeah, children I've taken photos of my do. kids, I've always got orbs around our young winters. Oh, really? Don't ask me Maybe why she's she a ghost. <sighs> she's bloody something. <laughs> <laughs> Mm, well, ooh. right, okay, well, we'll have a really good look at all the footage later. And um, so, Deborah Davis, Psychic Medium, if you, if you look, it's Davis with an E, you'll find it anyway. No problem. Thank you for a lovely tour. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, see you later. Hi, everybody, I'm back now. <laughs> I'm really hoping that you enjoyed that. Um, don't know what this is here. It's worth a quick look, isn't it, before I go? So, hmm, 
<laughs> it's like a wash house, doesn't it? Some description. Uh, I uh, I hope you've really hope you've really enjoyed this. I've really thoroughly enjoyed doing it. And um, yes, it would have been nice to have been in there alone, but I can't get in there alone. So the next best thing is to take you on the tour. So there's the apprentice's house. Up to 90 children a year lived in this house and brought from orphanages, workhouses, and had to live here from the age of, I think it was eight or nine, she said, right through to 18 and work in the mill. Apparently, a very, very, very haunted place. Actually, I think I agree with that. Um, these are some of the outbuildings here. Please tell me if you see anything, sensed anything, screenshot for me. You never know, we just might see a face at the window. Okay, and there's Hubby. So, I'm off now, guys, and um, when I get home, I'll be having a look just to see what we caught at this place. So, bye bye, Style Mill and the Apprentice's House. And I'll speak to you all later on the page. Thank you very much for joining me today. Take care, everyone. Bye. <laughs>